I want to speak today on five words to change our world. Five words to change our world. But before I start, I just want to say, I don't know how you're finding it at the moment, but it feels like we're living through a slightly unusual time. You kind of see commentators and cultural observers desperately struggling to frame the season we're living in. It's a time of real challenge and complexity and uncertainty, and there are days when it feels like literally anything can happen and probably will when crises roll into crises and there are wars and rumors of even bigger wars on the horizon, and there's a complexity in the way we use language around identity, there's a polarization in our public debate, there's huge pendulum swings in our culture, and there's a loss of confidence in our institutions. And leaders often are struggling to lead, struggling even to find the confidence to lead. It used to be that if you're a leader of an organization, you would do it for maybe 10 years or 20 years. These days, you're lucky if you do it for 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Um, we've got prime ministers changing faster than the, the bed linen. And, um, you know, it's like it's a crazy, crazy time. It's like the average leader in the world is not lasting very long. The 24-hour news cycle, the complexity of decisions is just chewing them up really, really quickly. And then we have the church which has this unique role to shape our times, has always had this unique role to shape the times we live in. But then at times it feels like the times are shaping the church. We feel the church has this unique role to speak truth to power, but at times it feels like power is imposing itself on the church. And what do we make sense? How do we make sense of this crazy season? Because we know that Jesus has conquered sin and death and that he rules and reigns in the universe. But we're also sometimes, if we're honest, a little bit like, yeah, but Jesus, that was before Twitter. That was like, that was before life became really complicated. That was before the rolling news cycle and before all these other things. It was simpler then. It's much more complex now. And I was um, struck uh, reading um, uh, a a poem you're probably familiar with by Yeats, um, The Second Coming. He says, things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed on the world, the blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. And then this, the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. It's a phrase which seems to sum up our moment. The best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And then this, surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. I think such a helpful thing because at the same time as all this complexity and chaos and difficulty to frame the times we're living in, there's also this really exciting opportunity There's this openness. I think one of the things that's happened is as everything has been shaken up in our world and our nation and in our culture, people have kind of stood aside from their lives and looked at them and said, actually, I don't want to live my life according to the old assumptions. I don't want to just assume these narratives that have been passed on to me. And that has created a remarkable openness in people's lives, the like of which I don't think we've seen for many, many years. We're seeing an extraordinary number of people come to church who don't know the name of Jesus and are encountering Jesus and then finding the name of Jesus is precious to them. That's a remarkable thing. We're engaging with many people each week who are just coming across either Alpha or our student ministry or our ministry to the vulnerable in our city who have this almost feel drawn here and they can't work out why. But there's this openness and they want to know more. It's a really exciting time. So how do we make sense of this complexity and this opportunity? How do we make sense of this desire to be closer to Jesus and this intimacy in our worship and this desire to grow in our faith at the same time as recognising that there's real challenge and complexity in our day-to-day lives? Well, as I was praying about that this week, uh, I was reading my Bible. I was, on, I was on holiday this week, actually, but I, I read my Bible on holiday, just so you know. And, uh, and I read this passage we've just had read by Nemi. And there were five words that sort of jumped out at me as I read it and stayed with me for a whole day. 
And so I thought, actually, it, it's something that I felt wasn't just for me, was for us. Afraid, yet filled with joy. Mary and Mary, as they left the tomb, were afraid, yet filled with joy. I think that summarizes something of the tension we're living in, that there are real fears, there are real challenges. We can't be naive about what's going on. We can't just put our heads in the sand and pretend that nothing is happening. There are real challenges, and yet there are extraordinary, overflowing, overwhelming joys. When God moves powerfully in a community, in a church, in a city, in a nation, it's often characterized by holy fear and overwhelming joy. Two things that very rarely go together, fear and joy. Maybe when you have a baby, there's this kind of awesomeness, this sense of, wow, this is so exciting, I'm filled with joy. But also this terror that you actually have to take the thing home and you're responsible for it and you have to look after it and you can't just press pause. That's it now. You're always going to be a parent for as long as that baby lives. It's like awe and joy. Maybe when you start a job, you feel a bit underqualified for. You're excited, you're full of joy at the opportunity that's come your way, but then there's the realisation of the responsibility you've taken on. But it's rare in life to have fear and joy bound together. But that's often what we see when God moves. And we're going to look at this passage together. And the first thing we see in this passage is that there's a move, a move from fear to awe. Mary and Mary, they're, they're fearful, they're afraid, they come across, I mean, they're very brave in a way, they come across the tomb, they know it's guarded by soldiers, they know the authorities are on the hunt for Jesus' followers, they're making themselves quite obvious, even by coming to watch at the tomb. And yet they come, and then they find this extraordinary scene. The soldiers scared half to death, an angel just chilling out on a stone, relaxing, the tomb empty. And understandably, you would feel in that context a bit of fear. It's interesting. What does the angel say? Do not be afraid. And there's lots we might fear today in our own lives. We might fear what's happening in our jobs, in our finances. We might fear being alone. We might fear cultural ties. We might fear the complexity of ranging children. We might fear failure. We might fear something about our future. And there are helpful fears which keep you alive. Uh, stop you falling off cliffs and things like that. But then there are lots of unhelpful fears as well, and we all face those. It's one thing when fears are flying around your head. We all have that. It's another thing when fears take up home in your heart and they're bothering you at two o'clock in the morning. So important to starve our fears and feed our faith. But often we find ourselves starving our faith and feeding our fears. And if you feed your fears, you can end up in some pretty odd places. I still vividly remember um, at the end of my three years as a student here, for some reason they examined the entirety of my degree on nine three-hour exams at the end of three years, which was good if you were a blagger, but also quite stressful. And I'd done almost all the exams. I had two exams left, and my final exam was in criminal justice. And I was just walking through the park the day before the criminal justice exam, and... I suddenly saw the professor of criminal justice walking towards me. And I thought, what are the odds? And I thought, shall I say hi? I didn't know him. There were 200 people in the class. But I thought, let's crack a joke. Why not? And so as he came towards me, I said, have you got any tips for Tuesday afternoon? And he looked at me with a face of just like horror and bemusement and just carried on walking. And I was like, oh, that didn't go the way I was intending it to go. And he just carried on walking away. And I thought, it's okay. He doesn't know who I am. Uh, he, 200 people in the class, I'll never see him again, we're good. And as I walked away, I thought, what if he does know who I am? And I thought, what? I think he probably didn't hear me. And I thought, what if he did hear me? Well, if he hit, heard me, why, why didn't he laugh? And then I thought, oh, maybe he thought I was being serious. Maybe he thought I'd like hunted him down in the park to kind of ask, what are the answers for the questions that I need? Maybe he thought I was actually trying to cheat on this exam. And I was kind of following, and I thought, it'd be okay, it'd be okay. And then on the day of the exam, 1.30, I was walking towards the exam hall, and he was in front of me. I thought, he's not just setting the paper, he's invigilating the exam. He's going to be there as I'm trying to take the exam. And I thought, maybe I should try and speak to him. You know, the fear is kind of rising within me, and I was feeding it. And I thought, I'll just go up to him and say, Professor, you know, you might have seen me in the park a couple of days ago. 
If you don't remember, don't worry, we can stop it there. But if you do remember, you might have heard me say, what are the others? I wasn't cheating, don't think I was cheating. I'd never cheat. Um, I love your course, don't worry, please don't mark me down for it. And I got about two paces away from him and thought, this is madness. Don't do that, Steve. That's a terrible idea. And kind of walked away. But I could have like wrecked my degree in that one moment. Actually, as it happened, went through, fine, got a degree, everything was okay. But if you feed your fears, you can end up in some very strange places. So important in life, starve your fears, feed your faith. Don't feed your fears and starve your faith. Mary and Mary have faced real, reasonable fears. I mean, Jesus had died He'd been placed in the tomb. They had seen just before the stone rolled in front. They'd seen the death of a dear friend. But even more than that, they had lost everything. Their hopes devastated. The future they longed for closed off to them, ended. Their trust in Jesus, was it misplaced? And the authorities soon to be hunting them and them to be exposed as his followers. They have every reason to fear. And yet, there's still a courage in them. They still come to the tomb and they come face to face to the angel and then face to face with Jesus and both say the same thing to them. Don't be afraid. How can you be in the midst of chaos, in the midst of things that should cause you to fear and not be afraid and not fear? Well, in the Bible, generally speaking, there are only two categories of fear. There's the fear of God, which is described remarkably positively throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament. 300 references to the fear of the Lord in the Scriptures. All of them very, very positive. The fear of the Lord brings blessing. The fear of the Lord brings wisdom. Those who delight in the fear of the Lord will have no fear of bad news. There's the fear of the Lord described as a positive, constructive, wonderful thing in your life. And then there's every other type of fear, which are generally described of as negative. What's interesting in our culture is that as faith has receded, as the fear of the Lord has decreased, every other fear has increased. So cultural commentators say this is the age of fear. They describe Gen Y and Gen Z as generations of fear. Biggest challenge facing the generation that's rising up is this relationship with fear. It's almost we've taken this one healthy, right, constructive, positive, good fear and rejected it. And in its place, we've taken on board thousand and one unhelpful, irrational, really confusing fears in its place. So what is the fear of the Lord? Well, God doesn't want you to be scared. He loves you. He wants you to live a life uninhibited by fear. It's why Jesus says here, don't be afraid. It's why the angel says, don't be afraid. Have no fear. It's one of the most common commands in the Bible. But the antidote to every other fear is to have a good, a a proper, a right fear of the Lord. And what that means is like, an awe, a wonder, a reverence at who God is and what God has done. To be so captivated and overwhelmed and in awe of who Jesus is that it so fills your heart that other fears just don't quite have space to land. To see Jesus in his holiness, his beauty, his majesty, his power, his grace, so that it grips you with this deep reverence. And I think that's what happens to Mary and Mary here. As they leave the angel, they're afraid, yet filled with joy. Because it's become clearer to them now just who Jesus is and just what he's done. And that hope, that joy is captivating for them. They've come face to face with the king. In some ways, the hallmark, the proof of an encounter with the living God is that we are afraid, yet we are in awe and wonder of who God is. What I think the world needs today is followers of Jesus who are shaped 
by an awe of who he is. They are afraid, yet filled with joy. They fear the Lord, so they are fearless in the face of every other fear. What does that look like? Well, Matt's going to come and demonstrate for me now. And um, uh, so I don't know how you find it in life, but uh, just in your normal everyday life, there are fears that come at you from time to time. And uh, you might be um, uh, on the bus in the morning or traveling into work, or maybe you're just chatting. And, and before you know it, you get an email from someone and the email is kind of like, oh, that person is a bit upset with me, a bit of subtext there, maybe a bit passive aggressive. Maybe I've upset them in some way. And then someone else, you, you step on someone's feet as you're getting on the bus and there's, oh, that person still got to do that, that thing. And oh, there's that thing. And all these fears come at you and, oh, maybe, maybe I've messed up in that area. Oh, maybe I've made a mistake. And oh, that, that date didn't go very well. Maybe that relationship's going wrong. And then every, every now and again, a fear doesn't land. But generally speaking, you can, you can become so full of these fears. It's almost like you just take them on during the day. And it's like we can become so filled by fear that it's almost as if there isn't room for God to land in our lives. It's like we're so full of fear that there isn't space. We might say, oh yeah, I want to focus on God. But the fears are crowding God out in our life. So that's one way of doing it. But there's another way of doing it, um, which is to be so full of awe, so, so consumed, so aware of who Jesus is, so filled with a sense of God's glory and majesty, and so in reverence of him, that that just fills your heart and your mind and your life. And so when the other fears come, you know, you just... Um, <laughs> You know, you're not as impacted by them. And uh, they don't quite have the space to land. And it's like, well, I know God loves me and I know he's for me and I know he's with me. The more you are filled by an awe at who Jesus is, the more you're captivated by love for him, the more the Holy Spirit reveals to you his beauty and his majesty, the less space there will be in your life for other fears to land. You can fill your life with fears and crowd out God, or you can fill your life with reverence at God and crowd out the fears. Thank you so much to Matt. (laughs) But then the second thing we see in this passage is that their fear is connected to their joy. I love this word, yet. Afraid, yet filled with joy. The holy fear that they feel in this passage creates are yet in the hearts of them. You see, worldly fear, it kind of freezes, it incapacitates, it tells you to back away, it tells you to bunker down, it tells you to batten down the hatches, tells you not to take risks, tells you not to be creative, tells you not to risk anything, tells you to hedge your bets and to hide yourself. There were lots of people hiding at this moment. But Mary and Mary are bold. Mary and Mary go to the tomb. Mary and Mary go from the tomb to tell the others. Holy fear, the presence of God, it motivates, it inspires, it emboldens, it's generative, it's creative. You want to take risks because when you know you have the love of the only person in the universe whose opinion ultimately matters, what have you got to lose? You can risk everything else. And so even though they are afraid, yet they run to tell other people what they have seen and heard. Their fear motivates them, pushes them out, encourages them to take risks. They didn't hide, they ran and told people. They were afraid, yet they were filled with joy. And I still remember the first time I felt that sense of awe and being filled with joy. I was... Uh, 18 years old, I was at the end of my first year at university, and if I'm honest, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, I was very much one foot in, one foot out with church. So like, I would go to church when it suited me. I would turn up when I didn't have anything better to do. You know, I would tell people I was a Christian every now and again if it came up and I felt I could trust them. But your average person who knew me There wasn't anything that was distinctive about my day-to-day life. And to be honest, I was quite happy that way. I felt like I got the best of both worlds. And I could live it up in the bar on Friday night. And every now and again, I could turn up at church, chuck a couple of quid in and feel better. That was kind of how I was living my life. And then I was in a service worshipping 
at the end of my first year. And I just sensed in a whole new way the beauty of Jesus. I sensed in a whole new way the glory of Jesus. Like the Holy Spirit gripped me, and I couldn't actually physically move for quite a long time. Like I, I was weeping and, and um, couldn't move for a long time. And actually, if I'm honest, I couldn't speak for a really long time, which, if you know me, shows it was a definitive work of the Holy Spirit because I just couldn't speak. I was just awestruck. It's like the Holy Spirit showed me in a whole new way who Jesus is and what he has done. It's like it says in the Psalms, with you there is forgiveness so that you may be feared. And I suddenly became aware of how much I needed to be forgiven and how much God was worthy of my worship and how much I became aware of his majesty. It was like this strange sense of fear, but it was a good fear. It was a fear that crowded out all other anxieties. It was a fear that felt comforting. It's like I was in the presence of a king and he didn't want me to leave. And I felt in my heart this deep love, this deep joy. And I felt like I'd been set on fire. So in the weeks that followed, I'd struggled with so many, let's say what it is, I'd struggled with so many sins. Messed up in more ways than I care to remember. But in the weeks that followed, I didn't find it so hard not to do those things anymore. I used to swear a lot as well. And I didn't find it as hard not to swear. I used to be quite fearful about people even knowing that I was a Christian. And in the weeks that followed, suddenly actually that fear didn't have a grip on my heart anymore. And I was more concerned about what God thought of me than what other people thought of me. You know, I came away that night and to any other person, I would have looked exactly the same. But I was completely and utterly changed. And that's what happens here. They are filled with joy. Their hopes are restored. Jesus is true. He is good. And he can turn even bad things for good and their good things are never lost. You know, it's easy to look in our culture and say at the moment, it's just too complex. It's too challenging. You know, why have we been called to follow Jesus at this time? Wouldn't it be much easier if we were, you know, following Jesus in 1650? You know, in 1650, it was easy to lead a church. People were fined if they didn't turn up. Simple. You know, 1950. Everyone in the UK pretty much thought they were a Christian. Imagine trying to invite someone to Alpha in 1950. Would you like to come to Alpha? What's Alpha? It's for people who aren't Christians. I don't know any of them. It's for people who don't go to church. Oh, we all go to church. Well, you know your, your co-worker who doesn't know Jesus? No. Oh, you know your family member who doesn't go to church? No. You know your friend who's not yet a Christian? No. It's boring. You know, today, you walk outside this church, you throw a stick, you'll hit three people who've never heard the name of Jesus. That's exciting. It's much more fun. We could have been called to follow Jesus at any time. And we're called to follow him at this, I think, one of the most exciting times in the history of the world. Yes, it's challenging. Yes, it's difficult at times. Do we need integrity and skill and wisdom to navigate all the different tensions in our workplaces and our families and our communities? Yes, is it going to be challenging at times? Yes. Do we need the support of our brothers and sisters in Christ to be praying for us and encouraging us and building us up? Yes. Is it exciting? Yes. Is there huge potential for God to do something in this time? Yes. Because why not? This is exactly the sort of context in which movements go viral guy in my alpha group, I said to him, who, who invited you to church? He said, no one did. I said, what do you mean no one did? He said, well, I just, I just came. I said, well, surely your auntie invited you. No. Oh, well, maybe a friend at work. No, I don't know any Christians at work. Oh, maybe, maybe someone in your family said, oh, no, no one in my family is a Christian. I'm like, well, maybe like, uh, I don't know, someone you knew from uni? No, none of my friendship group are Christians. I can't believe it. It worked out. This guy had not knowingly met a Christian in his entire life. And he just turned up. Now, you could look at that and say, oh, woe is us. Here's a guy with 250 people. He's never met a Christian in his life. Or you could say, what an exciting opportunity. Here's a person with 250 friends who's never been exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If he encounters Jesus, if he comes to know him, just think how that could blow through a whole community of people in the coming months and years. This is an exciting time to follow Jesus. 
afraid, yet filled with joy. What I love about this passage is as they run, they are inspired, they're motivated by what they've seen. And then it says, suddenly Jesus met them. Suddenly Jesus met them. Sometimes said God only has two speeds, slowly and suddenly. Years of faithful prayer, years of faithful intercession, years of patient conversation, and then suddenly God moves in power. God can do more in a day than we could accomplish in our whole lives on our own. Sometimes I think it's a little bit like the 2P machine at the arcades at the seaside when you were growing up. You know, you put in the 2Ps and they kind of gather up and they gather up and they're being pushed forward and they're being pushed forward. It looks like nothing's going to happen. You put in more 2Ps, more 2Ps, nothing's happening. And then suddenly there's a crash. Suddenly there's a breakthrough. Suddenly it happens. If you're like me, you get impatient and you give it a little nudge just before then and help it on its way. Suddenly, Jesus met them. I believe this is a time for sudden encounters with Jesus. You know, seeing people who have wandered off coming to know him. Seeing people who don't even know the name of Jesus, finding that name precious. Seeing people, I think some people who, maybe you've prayed for them for many years. Maybe your children coming to know Jesus in this season. Maybe your parents who you've been praying for, coming to know Jesus in this season. Maybe you're someone who actually, your grandparents know Jesus. Parents has never been a big thing in their life, but it's like God has skipped a generation and he's going to call you to come and know and follow Jesus. And then they clasped his feet and worshipped him. It's the fear of the Lord. They're in the presence of Jesus and all they can do is worship him because he's the risen king. He's the Lord of all. He's conquered sin and death and he has not abandoned his people. He's not left them alone. I love this. They clasp his feet when they see him in his risen glory. Why do they clasp his feet? Because they're already on their knees. And when you're in the presence of the risen Jesus, the most natural thing to do is to fall to your knees in awe and worship. It's holy fear. It's joy filling people's hearts and they worship him. They bow down before their king and worship him. They're afraid, they're full of awe and yet they're filled with joy because they're in the presence of their king. I think this is a time where God wants to grow us as a people, to be people who are afraid, to be people who are full of awe and full of joy, to people to realize what a precious thing it is to enter the presence of the living God and to long to be transformed, to be a people who are desperate to see Jesus more clearly, to see who he is. I'm convinced that if this generation sees Jesus as he is, They'll be transformed by him. If the people you're praying for can just see Jesus as he is, as Mary and Mary do here, they'll be transformed because he's beautiful, he's majestic, he's worthy, he's glorious. Afraid, yet filled with Joy. Just think what could happen as we go out into our workplaces, our businesses, our communities, our colleges, our universities, filled with awe and fearless in the face of every other fear and filled with the creative, the exciting, the transforming joy of knowing him. People might say there's something different about these people. They walk to a different beat. They're motivated by something different. They're transformed in some way and I want to know more.